uh, I saw Frank Observer from a political party. Uh, I saw uh, some people just being worried. Maybe uh, she was uh, up to something, but uh, uh, she didn't stay long. Yeah. So I watched that process. It was okay. And then I moved to the exciting one. And when I got there, uh, I was treated as if I come from IEC. So everything that was wrong, uh, they pointed to me. So mm. I had to fix whatever that was going on there. Uh, it was very scary. I thought about running away. Uh, but uh, because I saw so many familiar faces there, and when they saw me, they got excited because uh, they thought maybe um, I'm going to, I don't know, I'm going to assist in a way in terms of uh, electing the right, the, the right person for my community. Um, but yeah, that process went. And then uh, when problems started uh, <laughs> coming in, uh, there was so much noise that uh, when I went for lunch, I thought about not coming back. Mm. Uh, but then uh, Bali and my Nzala, who is wise man, <laughs> they said I must take a picture. And I insisted in taking a picture because Brian was on my case uh, about getting the picture. If you are observing, they must, so they must see the place. Yeah. So I was like, eh, eh, now I must also show my face. I was there, even though I'm scared. I went there and uh, took a picture. And when they saw Mbali and wise men, they were like, ah, we are saved. Uh, so all the problems now, they were uh, taken by Mali and wise men. And I was like, yay, uh, Jesus just saw my cry. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus is a big Jesus. feature of these elections. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I was really scared. I, I'm going to say this. I was really scared because uh, lots of people know me. Yeah. And when they saw my face, everything that was wrong, they was, they was just like, I was part of that. So mm. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who to call. Uh, I was just, I hope nothing happens uh, to me. But that's how everything, there was so many wrongs. Yeah. Uh, if I could start naming them, some people were just saying them. Uh, so I was like, oh, it's fine. It's happening. Yeah. In my station, So it's yeah, political. Yeah, so that was just me. Sebong, I call this one. Um, Sebong, for your contributions. Call us some shadows under. Um, um, Reverend Matthias, you may unmute yourself and maybe comment. We did see your comment in the chat section indicating that uh, some of the electioneering or campaigning outside of the rooms needs to be stopped. Um, what are there any additional comments that you may have for us? Uh, great thanks to everyone. Um, um, I, I visited two voting stations and I just want to say that uh, the work of the IC, I, I really appreciated how it was. The level of consultations with party agents on each decision they intended to make was an awesome one. Um, uh, my biggest worry is this issue of campaigning on the I, I wish maybe the recommendation should be that uh, if people campaigning nearby or supporting should be at least maybe 100 meters away from the station because these people, what do they do? They will make a big noise and very hard to be, the noise was too much, but what they do also, it's like a protocol. They will hand, hand shake people coming and like dragging them in, almost inside. It's like they are directing them how to vote. And I, I wish that is the main thing I've seen and which my, I really request that that should be uh, dealt with. The other thing I maybe wish to state is um, when ICE is uh, recruiting uh, people must work in a particular area, shouldn't not uh, put people from the same area for the transparency, because when the people are used to these people, they are likely not to correct whatever mistake is happening. Thank you. That is my two observations.
Thank, thank you very much for joining us, Reverend. We appreciate your feedback and your participation as part of our mission. Um, all right, so now I'm going to go into the presentation um, that we have today. Let me just see. Okay, so let me go back to that and say share screen. Uh, so as I was saying, part of what we must consider is that yes, um, we we are sometimes very in, integral to the to the to the work of the commission and of the station at the time um, because uh, we at the democracy development program also devote quite a significant amount of time in training and the capacity building of our observer mission it tends to create the impression that we might be there's a sense that we might actually be doing more than the commission might be doing insofar as capacity building is concerned um when we talk about the subject of capacity building um as you were talking about insofar as recruitment is concerned one of the things that are significant um is that this year at least from what i've noticed or what i heard and what i saw only the presiding officers and deputy presiding officers were trained by the commission um that training due to COVID 19 um, uh, due to COVID-19, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, but I, when I continue, <laughs> um, so, uh, because of the, of, of the pandemic, um, what happened with the presiding and deputy presiding officers from the information that I'm aware of, they were trained online um, and they took online tests and exams. We know that that process is not, as some of you might be students as well, is not always uh, the best way of measuring someone's capacity um, or ability to conduct work. Um, so potentially this might be the other fix that they found themselves in. The work then of the presiding and deputy presiding officers was to train the other individuals who are part of that station. Um, I think they were, I assume, remunerated for that specific aspect. From the date at which U Wiseman and I started work, because we started on early, uh, on the during the special votes, um, we know, for instance, that when we, oh, was I with you, Mbali, on that, or during that briefing, the um, KZN ROC, the KZN Results Operation Center, we went in there, we were meant to have a briefing with the IEC, that started about two hours later than it was meant to, um, which meant, as an observer mission, um, which meant we were essentially given official communication from the IEC for about 30 minutes, um, as, a, as an observer body, it was meant to be handling other observers. Um, they have, there were other online sessions that were being run nationally. So there was one in KZ and one in, 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 the, in the Western Cape, because those are the ones that we had registered to be a part of. Um, so at least we saw those online, online sessions were happening. But here in KZN, I don't know what it was, but it felt as though we were a secondary consideration in terms of our observe, observer mission. I don't know what the nature of the training of electoral staff was, but if the way, that's the way in which we were trained, it raises some questions. Um, so yeah, so we were waiting for two hours and then the training happened for about 45 minutes um, before the official launch of the results operation center. Um, but what I was also aware of the conversation was, um, whilst we were being trained as observers in that space, deputy presiding officers and presiding officers were meant to be training the rest of their staff um, on Friday, Friday before the special voting day. Um, on special voting day itself, the first day, one, we know that some voting stations hadn't done that, that, that training for the electoral staff inside the voting stations. The second thing was that the materials for keeping uh, COVID-19 regulations didn't arrive on time uh, at most voting stations that we were able to observe on, on, the, on the special voting day. Um, so there were some challenges that the IEC was confronting. Um, we don't know to what extent um because that's also difficult to to especially with social voting days not much observation is done on 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 those days which means that even some of the anomalies that mike is picking up might not be adequately registered according to the the the, 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 the figures related to special voting um i hadn't actually gone into checking out insofar as voter turnout for special voting specifically because people make the effort of registering for special votes 
um, because they know they won't be available for the, the, the actual election itself on the main voting day. So those are some of the things just preliminary that we wanted to sort of talk through. Um, so I'll try and, 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 and go through the report on some of the basis that um, the IEC itself was trying to, to, to talk to us about as they were conducting their briefings in the early part of um, 2021, but also towards the end, to, towards the last quarter of 2020. And part of what we would know is that there were some electoral amendment bills um, that were being considered and put before parliament that were already during April, March of this year. Um, they were they were be, they were already at, at both houses of parliament, which means the National Assembly as, and the National Council of Provinces. And in so far as that's concerned, that bill was meant to increase the registration levels of political parties. It attempted to provide for a varied procedure for voters without addresses. Um, of course, you'd remember that in instances where you live in a relatively rural areas, um, you would you would not necessarily have an address. Um, and that would certify or allow for that voter registration process to occur because it means that then they would have all of the addresses because that's what the constitution requires that there's a verification process at least some verification about where voters live in particular but you know the increased importance of around addresses when it relates to local government uh, 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 elections because you can only vote in the ward in which you reside and the nature of how wards ward boundaries shift from election to election sometimes has an impact on where or where you vote or where you are moved to insofar as your voting station of VD is concerned. Um, that, that bill also attempted to clarify the effective date of the electoral code of conduct, balancing the right of, uh, to privacy of personal information, the right to freedom of expression in the publication of the voters at all. Um, it also tried to rationalize the need for submission of an acceptance of nomination form. Um, it also attempted to remove the ballot paper statement from the act to be revised in regulations. So that was the bill that was intended for, that was updated. So as part of our report, we go through an analysis of all of the laws that relate to uh, the way in which we meant to vote, the quality or the impact of those laws on the way in which we end up voting. So, the, so I'll be going through a bit of background before we, we move on. Um, yes, before I get to the, to, the, to the meaty parts, as it were. Um, so um, you'd also be aware that we had the implementation of a political party funding act. Um, this year in the news, some organizations would be aware that uh, a certain political party hasn't been able to pay their staff uh, <laughs> um, because of the nature of uh, financial disclosures um, that are meant to be happening in relation to, to, to political fu party funding. So this act is intended to provide the funding of represented political parties. So it means primarily the, the, the parties that are meant to be disclosing at least this year are those which are which are ordinarily represented in the uh, in in on the on in national assembly in particular. Um, they try to regulate the direct private donations to political parties and thus bring transparency in the realm of political party funding. Um, some of the concerns when this when this act was being promulgated was that it seems as though uh, private interests are swaying the 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 way in which people in power are exercising that power. Um, we remember we've even had the State of Capture Commission um, in order to try and investigate these aims of political parties. Okay, so furthermore, the act intended to protect the sovereignty of the country by regulating donations from foreign countries. Um, it's important to note that represented political parties for the purpose of this act refers only to political parties that have representation either in the National Assembly and or a provincial legislature. So it doesn't necessarily speak to um, political parties at local government level. Um, and so funding from the represented political party fund and multi-party democracy fund is only provided to these represented political parties. Um, so Jobangi Fage Lapana and Azus Benginzan e Gi Bon Amin. Got again. Uh Lolain Lopez. What's it what's in Lapumbal? No, go back. What's in Lolain? I wanna add Nalap. Yeah, was gonna say on No 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 and a donation. Oh, okay. So essentially the definition of donation, a donation is a donation in cash 
Um, it could be also in kind, or it could be in both. The idea is that you're able to calculate based, if it's in kind, it means it might mean a service. So for those of you who operate, who are DJs, if, if Vijen was donating to the African National Congress, for instance, and he says, listen, I don't have any money, but I'm willing to uh, give, get my soundtrack to you um, for a specific rally for free, because that's my donation. He would ordinarily invoice people. So the, so the invoice that he would ordinarily charge, a city uh, Vijen charges 50,000 for his soundtrack for six hours because um, of the equipment, you know, the quality, JBL, everything, you know, Lani's. Um, so <laughs> so 50,000 for six hours uh, for the soundtrack, that's essentially how much he would have donated in, in monetary terms to the, to the African National Congress, if that's the party we're considering insofar as donations are concerned. So when we talk about, that's what we mean when we say donations in kind. Um, all the political parties must disclose any donations received that are cumulative, cum, cum, uh, cumulatively uh, above 100,000 from a single source. So if Vijen in a single quarter uh, decides he wants to donate for multiple rallies in that quarter, um, which might be on, which might end up amounting to 150 uh, ra uh, thousand rands. He, the political party would need to dis disclose that Vijen uh, donated to the political party in that in that essence. The maximum amount that may be donated by a single source to a political party is 15 million. Um, I think we saw it was a charter house, is it Ch chancellor house uh -huh. um, went went to that threshold and, and and actually donated to a single political party. But of course, we know now that that is a vehicle for 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 funding from for any any money donated to any of the constituent parties or or constituent parts of a political party is seen as money donated to the party. So when we talk about that, it means that if you're making a donation to the women's league or if you're making a donation to the National Youth Task Team, you, it's also a donation to the political party itself because it's affiliated with that political party. So you can't run away from disclosures by saying, no, it was, from, for, the, it was for the Student Command Council. Um, I think that's what they call it, BFF. Yeah. Um, for, for now, or DASO, um, the DA Students Organization. So in, in those instances, those qualify as donations to the political party itself. For now, only political parties are required uh, to disclose their donations above 100,000 and to keep a record of any donations below 100,000. Independent candidates and councillors are exempt from the obligation to disclose. So interesting stuff. Um, what I just want to say about the, the Party Funding Act it has serious implications it, or, and has had serious implications for the ability of political parties to campaign. That's at least from an observer perspective, what we want to try and highlight and point out that campaigns haven't, didn't go to the extent that they ought to um, in order to reach certain communities. We did see um, some political parties who ordinarily had had um, both um, um, mainstream media appeal, which includes TV, radio, um, as well as social media appeal, not having the same significant footprint. Um, one of the political parties that we are aware of didn't even uh, decide to do a, 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 a TV ad because of the expenses tied to that. And as a result, we only heard the adverts on radio, for instance, um, because of the differences in terms of the financial implications. So uh, from a voting perspective, it's, it's questionable to what extent voters has the ability to, to actually read through and understand what the different political parties were trying to present to them as a result of the uh, Political Party Funding Act. But at the same time, what that means is that voters also had the capacity to make a decision around um, the, the potential sources of party, of, of, of party funds. To what extent are those sources um, necessarily, they might be coming from sources that are, uh, that are problematic or that come from, that are, that are siphoned through state funds or even um, from companies that are trying to enforce a specific policy direction towards a specific political party. So that's something that was at least in the voters' mind from our perspective as, as part of our election observation process, okay? Um, you would know then we have nationally um, eight municipalities, uh, metropolitan municipalities. Metropolitan municipalities are those municipalities that are not considered local, don't have a district council, all of that sort of stuff. Um, you would also know that there are other criteria aside from what I'm describing um, about metropolitan councils. We only have one, Sinetego, 
um, which is the one that's currently hanging in the balance insofar as mayorship is concerned. Um, what you might also be interested in finding out, we don't have an MMC. We don't have an executive mayor in, in, in Eteguin. We have an executive committee. Um, so that means that executive committee is somewhat representative of the demographic of council, right? But in the instance that that executive committee um, has a tie insofar as the way in which they vote, the mayor um, who is announced um, is the one that has the, the tiebreaker, the deciding vote, which is why it's important then um, this, this debate around mayorship, aside from how much money a specific person earns, it, it also has significant sway in terms of how the, the municipality functions um, because of that deciding vote in the, in, the, in, the, in the committee that we'll be talking about. Of course, we then have local municipalities. There are 205 local municipalities across the country. And here in KZN, we have 43 of them. Um, there are 44 district councils. And in KZN, we have 10 of them. Thank you very much. Um, we did speak about the, the ward situation and how, what impact it might have on the voter and where they're able to vote. Uh, part of our report also talks about um, the, 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 the need for greater public participation in the, in the ward demarcation process. Part of what um, uh, has a significant impact on election outcomes is to what extent people feel empowered prior to the election itself. To what extent are people being consulted, engaged with constantly, especially when it comes to things that will impact how they vote and what, what vote, um, where, where, are they, where they are able to cast their vote. So at least in, in, in this regard, this was part of the work that we tried to highlight as part of our report. Um, as we move on to the next slide, then um, we also need to consider that the work of ward uh, demarcation is not undertaken by the Independent Electoral Commission. And perhaps as civil, civil society, civic education should also be focused around in ensuring that the right organizations, the right institutions are held accountable for the levels of participation as it relates to um, these specific aspects. Another significant thing that we thought it was important to highlight as part of the report was the debates around the election date. Um, Siakumbula, when we initially started with the, 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 the election process, electoral process from, from the DDP side, the election observation process from the DDP side, um, late April, um, early May, where we did our uh, initial briefing for civil society as well as other election observers. Um, and it was at that point, just before that, that workshop, um, that our president came out and said, elections will be on, what did they say, 27th October. Uh, 27th October, but then we were like, but he doesn't have the power to do that. This is not national elections. Um, so there was a, some debate initially, um, not debate. It was, there was just some confusion about why he thought he could do that. Um, of course, then um, the understanding and what you should be aware of is that only the minister of Cocktail has the ability to declare an election date for local government in particular. Um, at which point then we also heard from oh, oh minister, I, I think it might've been like a couple of weeks later, if not a month later, that she then de declared formally that the 27th would be the election date. Um, yeah, so then oh, what then happened was the Independent Electoral Commission was uncertain about its ability to host um, the election. And let me not say it that way. Let me say it was uncertain about the safety conditions um, in relation to COVID-19 and whether we can be able to have a, a, a genuinely uh, representative election as part of this process. And they went about to commission, uh, to, to institute a commission um, with the former Deputy Chief Justice Mosenek. Is it Deputy Chief Justice? Yeah, Mosenek, um, who then convened and maybe suggested that we might need to host it next year. But part of what he su suggested in his report was that um, the IEC would uh, require a, 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 the court um, that was duly uh, capable of delivering a specific decision, um, which, which then became the constitutional court. The conversation then swayed to why, why approach the constitutional court when we have the ability to amend the constitution 
at, 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 at national assembly level? Why isn't parliament determining this? And why are we allowing, for instance, parliament to be the one who's determining this, this specific conversation? Um, even at, that, at the stage at which the commission itself was undertaking its work, Mumosaneke's commission in particular, um, there were questions around the level of public engagement, specifically in relation to the election date itself. So whilst he had the ability to make a recommendation, um, citizens were saying, but sure, you can ask DDP, you can ask other institutions that are working on election management or elections specifically, but why aren't we as citizens directly engaged about this process of the date? And so at least there, there was another question there insofar as the public, the level of participa public participation that we're, that we're allowing as part of this process. And so um, with the eventual date um, then being promulgated, um, with with Uban, Minister of Cocta, then saying um, she's she's doing she's giving the 27th October as the eventual date, given that the Concord rejected the offer of the the, the IEC or at least the intention of the IEC. Um, the the date then became the first of November after the the the, the Concord made a decision. But at the time at which this was happening, there were also some other disagreements about to what extent does this then open the capacity or the potential for ca new candidates to be registered? We do know at the time at which the Concord challenge was being instituted that a, a, some political parties hadn't fielded candidates or hadn't uh, submitted their work on time. If you're a student, you would know. Uh, half an hour before you're meant to be submitting. Um, I, yeah, my deadlines are very important. So now people are complaining about USBs, they're complaining about internet access um, and, and the IC system being slow online. So those sorts of things. So those were some of the contestations that were happening in relation to that. And given, given even m myself, I was like, hey, I hope it's not this year because I'm tired. Eh? Uh, <laughs> there was just too much work, but um, there, were, there were a number of things that were, that were at play. Um, and, in, and in that regard, to a large extent, there's a sense that the election, the, election, the election process or the election period itself wasn't given enough space and opportunity to be adequately representative. Um, the IEC, I think, was talking about, is it 48 days um, that they were talking about having been given in order to convene, whereas they ordinarily require about 80 some odd days to be able to conduct um, preparations towards the election. So the amount of time being collapsed as a result of one late consideration from the Independent Electoral Commission, COVID was always going to be a factor. Surely we should have done the process of engaging these commissions, engaging the, the constitutional court quite earlier. Um, secondly, we can't skip necessarily a publicly, a publicly representative body such as the National Assembly in the way in which you make determinations about things that have implications on the constitution itself because of the makeup and the way in which we try to keep it supreme in whatever factor. So to that extent, um, there is some, some, some faults that we could impugn or uh, uh, judge the IEC um, on in that regard that surely this could have been done sooner. What was the reason for the delay? Um, and in that respect, um, a lot of this could have been avoided in the way in which the, the, pr the process itself became contracted. Um, um, one of the other things that are significant, as I think I've been talking about, the one, identifying the right institutions that we should hold accountable. Secondly, the level of partici public participation. The Independent Electoral Commission um, lists a number of, of, of um, institutions that they're meant to engage as part of their work in convening an election or in, in, in setting up an election process. Um, from a civil society perspective, um, we are identified here, um, civil society as well as observers, we, uh, we can point out to the fact that perhaps the last quarter of 2020 was not as, if, uh, uh, as, as early as we would have liked to have been engaged in relation to the election that was happening this year. Um, we do think that there's an opportunity um, in between, at least we, the AC generally has about three years in between an election to be able to prepare for an election, that we should keep these communication channels as open as possible in order to ensure that the work that comes out is genuinely uh, collaborative at the end of the day, um, that the way in which we conduct ourselves, um, we, we feel like we've been adequately engaged in that regard. 
Um, as we move on to the next slide then, um, the other thing that we wanted to talk about specifically is communication and voter education. Because of these multiple challenges, one, the election date, COVID-19, uncertainty about, about candidates, um, ward demarcations, um, the moving of voting stations, um, and ultimately what the local government elections are ultimately about. We feel that there's, a, there's been a, a significant lack of, of voter education and civic education in relation to these, to, these, to these outcomes. There's real work that still needs to be done to unpack the power of the vote for in, individuals in particular, um, and the extent to which individuals have the ability to shift the way in which um, vote, votes themselves end up going. Um, whilst we recognize our role as the as the democratic democratic alliance as well as the networks of the of the of, uh, of, uh, dem democracy de development program sorry uh, uh, <laughs> uh, um, hey, um, blue but yeah <laughs> Cool, yes. Okay, cool. So part of so 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 all of these things, but also COVID nineteen. So hey, guys, there's so much work in terms of educating our citizens that didn't happen at the point at which voting day itself was being held. Um, driving around, seeing people not engaging with the voting process. Sure, it was a long weekend. Sure, they had the ability to go at different times in the day, but they weren't adequately educated about the the, the power of their vote. Even whilst they understand the mechanisms, whilst we understand that there could be a protest a vote, so you not showing up to a, to a voting day, for instance, could be considered a protest um, of, the, of the process itself, but not enough people uh, were using it in that manner. They were just fed up with the system. And how do you communicate that in order for you to communicate you being fed up, you actually need to cast a vote one way or the other? You can't just divorce yourself from the entirety of the process. So, so at least in that respect, we feel like there's a lot of work that still needs to be done in relation to the uh, election, uh, election awareness, election education, electoral education in this country. But furthermore, that perhaps the campaigns around COVID-19 specifically um, weren't sufficient in ensuring that in, or in creating a sense of, and level of trust for citizens. Um, one of the biggest problems that we observed in relation to the COVID-19 regulations is that political parties, and primarily the political parties that is in charge of, of promulgating much of these regulations, because they are in leadership nationally, were not obeying these things when it came to their own campaigns. So, man, Jamal says we're level four, so Zongaba is a country. I don't know if you guys have been observing what's happening in Europe. Europe is burning in the streets because they're like, we don't want to go back to hard lockdown. <laughs> there's, a, there's a genuine sense that people are exhausted by these uh, regulations. Sure, uh, some of them don't want to vaccinate, but it's also important to recognize that it's difficult to follow the rules if political parties themselves are not playing the ball, particularly when it best serves their needs for them to, to, to sort of put certain things uh, like aside and say, I, so basically, are level four. You know, so those are the things that we wanted to communicate specifically about uh, communication and voter education. Um, thank you very much. As we move on to the next slide, recruitment and training. We did speak about this. Uh, I did highlight this earlier on, but you guys also spoke about it. And so far as the recruitment and training, one, the online training doesn't seem to have worked well for the for the presiding officers and deputy presiding officers. Secondly, um, there's still some sense that uh, there's not the, the the PLC, the party liaison committee aspect of ensuring that people are not um, partisan in the way in which they conduct their work. So they might not be in leadership, sure, but they are still affiliated members. And as such, they might exercise a specific um, discretion in favor of a specific political party in those roles as presiding and deputy presiding officers. Um, there's, there's some issues still to be addressed in that regard. And lastly, the idea that um, some uh, electoral staff might not have received any training at all as a result of the fact that um, IEC delegated the responsibility to presiding and deputy presiding officers might be uh, something for consideration. Thank you very much. Um, so according to the checklist, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the checklist, but I think in essence, I've covered a, quite a bulk of, of the stuff that we wanted to talk about. If we can move on from all of the stuff that has this. Okay, cool. <clears throat> 
I'll, I'll go back to the and tell you what I wanted to talk about just now with the, with that. Um, <laughs> A key innovation for the IEC was this um, new tool, this new voter management device, um, which was meant to be replacing the zip zips. Uh, we did remember in 2019, the zip zips were problematic because they were out, out of date. I am at Dala. Um, they just they were also operating offline, so it was difficult for um, people to track whether you may have voted once or twice in a specific uh, in a specific uh, election or in a specific day, uh, in particular. So this technology was meant to allow for enhanced voter registration, monitoring, and voter participation in real time. Um, but yeah, we did remember, we saw how many voting stations for us um, as part of the voter uh, uh, election observation, more than 70% more than of the uh, voting stations that we observed at, this was the biggest issue when it came to the delays, when it came to the people walking out of voting stations, not actually participating. But furthermore, beyond this specific tool itself, it seems as though there was um, a loss of data from an IEC perspective. Um, people updated their voter registration details and, uh, um, in September. Um, they went and they re-registered during voter, voter registration weekend. But it seems that the system, for whatever reason, reverted to a time before 20, 2021. Um, it seemed it reverted to 2016. There were people who were saying, we've lived here for 10, 15 years, but we're not appearing in this. We've been and we've been voting in this specific voting station. And the SMS that we're getting from the, from the IEC is saying, we must come to this voting station. But the machine doesn't recognize that for whatever reason. The difficulty here is that when you don't train your officials properly, they don't know what the protocol ought to be. So what was the num what does the form M something form? MEC 7 form. They weren't utilizing the MEC 7 form because they were relying so heavily on the vote uh, on, on this machine. So this machine would say, if you're coming to, to a voting station in Woodlands, um, no, please go to um, to um, copy, uh, Ketomen. Ketomen, I got to a to a um, <laughs> <laughs> or something of that nature. <laughs> so, like, so because of the heavy reliance that they, the, 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 it seems as though there were also no dry runs of the specific tool for the for the independent IEC itself. They didn't see and they didn't troubleshoot as to what ought to happen if this this specific tool fails. So as a result of this, we feel that um, voter turnout, yes, was going to be low anyways, but it might not, be, might not have been as low as it is if all of the tools and, and, and resources were utilized. One, the ability to troubleshoot, to say, if, I'm, if this tool is not working, what do we do? MEC 7 form. MEC 7 form, sure. How do you verify across voting stations that these forms have not been utilized in the same way by the same people? Um, and furthermore, um, it seems as though presiding and deputy presiding officers just didn't know who to call from the IEC, which is why they relied so heavily on the observers that we have in this room um, for support. It was like um, there were stations where I was the one calling the provincial um, elect ele election management people um, because it seemed as though the presiding and deputy presiding officers didn't have a list of people to call. They didn't know who the area managers were, um, which is problematic like it's 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 weird it's it doesn't make sense why why was why it felt in a lot of instances i even felt sorry for the presiding and deputy presiding officers because if this failed and they weren't told what to do after this failed they are being screamed at because people are rightfully trying to get their vote um cast they are being cre there's a there's a sense that they are incompetent even though it's not necessarily their own incompetence in relation to this process um so as a result this is going to be a significant part of the report in the way in which we unpack the report because of the implication it had not only on on on, on the individual officials who are operating at, at 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 those stations but for the voter who might not have been able to cast their vote because of this denial of their right to vote in in those instances um and as we move on to the next slide um another thing that we we were interested when we walked in was it a cater man or a rich view um we walked into a rich view as uh, and i didn't i was i was i was concerned for myself because i i was driving around the whole weekend i decided to go to i need some friends in the car with me um so we walked and it, we came in as a crew Sonka, we are election observers 
And uh, the area manager was there that time. All of a sudden, hey, area manager is like, guys, please keep uh, whatever, how many, two meters apart, ban, 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 sanitizing everyone in the line. You could see it wasn't happening all along. But because we were coming in, they decided, okay, this is the time we should now start obeying COVID-19 protocols. And so there's a real sense that even outside of the um, campaigns themselves, to what extent could the election um, have been a spreader event in, in, in because of the lack of, 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 of adherence to COVID-19 protocols? Of course, this is anecdotal um, that we, have, we hadn't correlated any data um, related to the health management systems that we have in this country. Um, NICD, um, we haven't been monitoring because to some extent, even that feels like it was waiting for a particular time before they start reporting again. Um, the actual numbers of, uh, yeah. The other thing is like, sometimes I wonder who's the one who's checking all of these things. Um, so thank you very much. We move on to the next slide. Single deal. Oh, you're not gonna report Leo. <laughs> Congratulations and well done. Um, I know that there aren't any questions. So what I'll do now is I'll ask U director, U Paul Karyuki to come to the front. I'll ask Mike to come to the front. I'll ask U Finals to take some pictures and then I'll ask U Tandiwa to also come to the front with the observer certificates for people that are here. Um, and we, you guys will hand over. Um, um, and we will hand over to the um, we'll use the podium and we're going to move the banner. Actually, no, we'll keep, we'll keep things there. We'll, we'll, I'll just move the table. I'm moving the table at the front, Chief. Standing, Shalis, <laughs> underfoot. I'm so wrong. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to ask you, if you are here, to come to the front, re receive your certificate from Mike and Paul, um, take a picture with them individually, and then come and wait at the front for a group photo. Okay? Sandi um, Ababizagawena. You're the one who's calling people's names. I've scored. Nombilo Kungula. Nombilo Kungula. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. All the way to Nyawose. Hey, Nam Sanjay Lasegangi, look and interact. Sabe Lungema. Guys, I've been on Mona Chinese land. Slindy left up. Temba Dube Miss Cubase. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Uta mega kubis. <laughs> Mohale Muloi Exen the Mabas. Shakespeare Valeni Ateta Mola Akin Lade Jais Dewe. Kundis. Paul Soti. Wiseman Lamini. Melusi Mashab No more on the Tandega Memela Miss Memela, who can? Yeah, oh, okay. Only mm -hmm. I called Miss Memela, yes, was a bona now, but. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, colleagues. Um, can we have a, a quick group picture in the front with all of the observers? Um, with your mask on, to please come to the front. Uh, Mike and Paul, to please wait at the front. Kandiwe as well. And it's in Pambil, Buffet. Um, no, no, the seats are there. Take the seats, colleagues. Yeah. Kandiwe can be in the middle and then. Uh, yeah. Sandiwe has been a significant part of this observer mission. Let us show you the band. Zamantu nga ubizi? No one gets to figure it. It's kind of got this difficult sack. Serious? What?
All right. Thank you so much, colleagues. Really appreciate your your participation. Um, we'd like then to set as we settle down. Can you tell sure. Thank you so much. Um, okay, it's on the business of Bethy. Should the Kule and Miss Niawose, Mabu Ting and Jewett and I'm in Ginga and Givele, Uzonga Zis and Konaso was Ugvel and Atego Facebook. Um, Smonga Kulugu, Kuma colleagues, let's go a go zoom no Facebook. Um, Bungle and Koskazi. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> really appreciate your support all the time. God is good. Uh, <laughs> hey, <laughs> um, colleagues, once again, thank you so much from the from the Democracy Development Program side, from my side as well, for your participation in all of the work that we've undertaken this year. This is our last um, open session for for 2021, um, and we'd like to thank you for your commitment to ensuring that we create a space that is adequately engaged, open to uh, public participation, but also that tries to hold our elected representatives accountable. We hope that part of this work of ensuring that we have um, credible, free and fair elections um, through our observation continues to, to gain as much traction as possible as we, as we continue this work of, of voter and democratic, democracy education. Um, mine has been just to facilitate to present the report. I'd now like to ask Um Umbalen Lemkeze to please um, join us at the front for the, the, the closing remarks for today. Um, and then Utandiwa will let us know where we're eating. Um, we're upstairs. Sisoto again, I'm telling you guys. So, so ne relax and Jego Sekai. Just a reminder. The, there are still some outstanding admin, admin, admin. If you're here, Ngazu, please speak to us, um, just as a reminder of some, some things. If, you, if you're still missing some things on your side, um, please let us know um, so that we can correct that before the end of this week. Because maybe we'll this week, says Cartel, a Satan, seven and Nati, says from Nugu Tati K from J, with December, said Tuzan. If you'd like to donate to uh, December Fund, Yami, I'll let you know. I'll put down my, 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 my details. No, <laughs> 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 thank you so much, Mbali. Over to you. Um, thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Can you please give us Pamad and Fongo a round of applause? This is our final program for the year, the very last one. Uh, thank you so much, colleagues, for the support. It has been a very, very difficult two years from last year, but we managed to, 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 to pull through. And thank you so much for your support, continuous support for supporting the organization. Please give yourselves a round of applause. It's been the Sponge for you, most of you who are here who participated in being part of the Observer Mission. We know it was last minute and you managed to pull through for us. And um, please continue to engage with us on our social media platforms at DDP Democracy, as well as our DDP website, which is www.ddp.org.za. Please continue to engage with us, Sandiwe. We are always at the office. So <laughs> can you please give a round of applause as well? All us taking queries and everything that needs to be done, preparing for all our conferences and all our, um, our forums for the year at the office. Lunch is, will be served upstairs. Thank you. We'll see you again. Stay safe. Um, I, not just observers, because I, I think it's important to acknowledge you with corner. So we can ask for a quick picture um, and then we can break. And then I'll ask Mike to just one second behind. Um, see, 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 see,
Langapambil. Sebunga kulu to our colleagues on Zoom and Facebook. This is the end of our broadcast. I hope that um, you have prepared yourselves a nice lunch. Um, <laughs> we will be having a session um, for our associate facilitators. Please remember, we're back here tomorrow. Uh, secondly, to um, other colleagues who are not necessarily associate facilitators, we do have a, a session with the Maiden Guardian online on Friday um, that will be speaking to the State of Capture Commission report. And uh, we'll have guests such from KSAC, Mr. Lawson Naidu. We have um, the executive director of AUTA who will also be represented in that space. We also have then U... U of Valencia Talane from, from Corruption Watch will be presenting at that panel. And of course, I'll be facilitating. So if, if nothing else, just come and, and watch me facilitate again. Thank you. <laughs>